Hello. Every year in this class, a small fraction of the student feedback is that they don't want to hear all the insights. They don't want all the entertaining crap. It's just annoying. They just want me to tell them how to do the problems on the exam. It's a small fraction of students. So in the sense of fairness and customer service, I give them one lecture per year. And this is that lecture. Today, we're going to cover a little bit more on current and resistance, a few more physical ideas around current and resistance, and then we will get into DC circuits. This week, we will do DC circuits today, RC circuits Thursday, and those topics will be on the exam. Last week's homework, there are two problems where you need the carrier density to do it, and I forgot that I didn't give it in lecture. So I'll give you those and I'll add time to those problems. Just throw them in another week. And today I will assign the DC circuit homework, which will be due next week and is covered on the exam. So here we go. Before we start drawing things as circuits, we're going to do sort of a physical problem. Let's imagine we have a battery like this. It's a nine volt battery. So it's got a positive terminal and a negative terminal. It, there is a graphite rod here. The graphite rod has the following properties. Its length is five centimeters. Its radius is five millimeters. Its resistivity, RG, is the resistivity of graphite, which is six times 10 to the minus four ohm meters. Copper wires, um, hold on one second. Copper wires connect each terminal of the battery to the graphite cylinder. The copper wires are identical. They have the following properties. The length is 10 centimeters. The radius is 0.5 millimeters and the resistivity of copper is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters. So for this setup, which isn't yet being drawn as a circuit, it's a physical thing that you can imagine. We want to ask the following questions. How much current will we get? How much current will flow out of the battery and through the setup? Um, what is the delta V or voltage drop across each element, meaning the copper, the graphite, and the copper? And we could also ask how much power is dissipated. So to answer all three of these questions, we will need to introduce a couple of new concepts. Um, let's see. Okay, so when you do something like this, often when you face a, cir a circuit problem or a problem like this, you look at it and you don't know where to start. Right? So usually you start by assign a variable current. I. And here, by a variable, I mean it is a mathematical variable. The current in this circuit will be constant, but I am describing it with a mathematical variable I. So the point is, you usually have to start with that to be able to write <coughs> the equations. So that means that current I is flowing out of the battery through the copper wire. Current I is flowing through the uh, graphite rod. And current I is flowing through the other copper wire. The same current must flow through the loop. Later, we'll get to different currents within a circuit when we have branches. Right now, we do not have branches. OK, another trick to solving these problems is that you can apply 
Ohm's law to each element of the circuit. Okay, so Ohm's law applies to the entire circuit. It applies to the copper. It applies to the graphite. It applies to the copper. It applies to the copper plus the graphite. You can take any subsection of a circuit, a resistive circuit, we're just doing resistors right now, and apply Ohm's law. It doesn't apply to the battery. That's not a resistive element. All right, so let's apply it. We will call this L, we will call this R, the two wires, and we will call this G for graphite. Apply Ohm's law to the left wire. Delta VL, which means this vague terminology, the voltage of that wire, the voltage drop across that wire. I apologize for the air quotes, that's unprofessional of me. The voltage drop across that wire. So what is it according to Ohm's law? It is the current that we know flows through that wire times the resistance of L. And the voltage drop across the right is that same current, the uniform current flows all the way, times the resistance of the right. And as you can imagine, the voltage drop across the graphite rod is the current times the resistance of the graphite rod. So there we just wrote three equations by applying Ohm's law to each element. And now we don't know the current, but we can figure out those R's, okay? So RL equals R right, because those are identical wires. So we use our formula equals rho L over A. Recall that is the resistance of the cylinder, if you know its resistivity. So rho uh, for the wires is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 8. The length of the wires is 0.1 meter, and the area of the wires is, point, is pi r squared. Doing everything here in MKS units. 0.1 meter, 0 0.005 is the radius of a one millimeter diameter wire. So if you solve that, you have a very small resistance, um, 0 0.0022 ohms. Okay. We could do the same thing with the graphite rod. R G equals rho L over A. Any material that's a cylinder, that's what you'll get. So that is uh, 6 times 10 minus 4. Let's speed up a bit. L is 0 0.05 pi, and now the cross-sectional area times 0 .005, in this case, squared. Here you're going to get a much larger resistance. You have a much higher resistivity. And, uh, well, you have this little drive it smaller, but the resistivity is what makes the big difference. And you get 3820 ohms. Mainly driven by the much larger resistivity of the graphite rod. And also, yeah, the word I made a mistake. It's highly unlikely. Okay, so now, so we could write delta VL equals I times 0 0.022. Delta VR equals I times 0 0.022. Delta VG equals I times 3820. Does this week's Canvas problems cover this week's lecture material? Yes. I have not released them yet. I'll release them uh, uh, after class. Yeah. So now we have um, a bunch of equations and a bunch of unknowns. We now, we don't know any of these VLs. Or VLs, VRs, VGs, and we don't know the I, although it is all the same. So it appears to me that we have uh, four unknowns and we have three equations. We need one more equation, and we're going to get it from um, the, the Kirchhoff loop rule. I will say it in the American way, the Kirchhoff loop rule. H, H, O, oh, I probably spelled it wrong. Loop rule. This is a physical principle that is irrelevant to you. It is a law you're going to memorize. And that is that the sum of the voltages 
around the loop equals zero. It is simply stating that here, if we call this plus nine volts, or if we call, let's say we call this zero volts, the battery takes us up to plus nine, and then we have to drop a little bit over the wire, drop a little bit over the graphite, drop a little bit more over the wire, and get back down to zero. So plus nine minus something minus something minus something has to equal zero. All it's saying is whatever voltage is generated by the battery must be dropped by the circuit. And you add those in sort of a sum to drop them. So in this case, it would really be uh, the EMF for the battery plus delta V um, L plus delta V R plus delta V G equals zero. So you can see that if we put a positive nine volts here, these would have to come out negative. And they do, because they are voltage drops. Drop, 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 has to add up to nine. So now what I'm gonna do is sort of erase this side and we will keep going on this problem. Let's see. So now we want to say, we want to use loop rule, but with those current expressions. Okay, so as we loop around, uh, we have a plus nine volts there. And now we have to think about the voltage drop across that copper wire. Ohm's law, it's IR. And we know it's negative when we're looping with the current, like we're gonna loop through the circuit that way. If we loop with the current, the voltages across the resistors are always negative because they're always a drop because you always, uh, current always flows from high potential to low potential. So final minus initial will always be a drop. So minus this current times 0 0.0022 minus the same current times 3820, that's that resistance, minus the current times 0 0.022. Right? Those all have to equal zero. So you can see this is uh, four equations and four unknowns, sort of, but the algebra works out where it's easy. Once you put those three equations into Kirchhoff's uh, loop rule, then you're set. Your only unknown is I. So here we can solve for I. And let me put in one intermediate step for you. I'm going to leave the nine on this side. And on this side, I'm going to put I. And look here, it's 3820.0044. <clears throat> so this is where we start to gain some insight into how these things work. So we have a question here. So does that mean that the battery is receiving zero volts as the loop comes back to the other side? Yeah, I wouldn't say receiving. Remember, so what a battery does is it holds this at zero and this at nine. Whatever current it has to flow to make that happen. So it sends just the right amount of current so that by the time we drop over that wire, we're back at zero. But if you say hold, it sounds like an active verb where the circuit is holding the battery. It's the other way around. The battery holds the circuit. Um, okay, so we have nine is the current times that. So we get a current of uh, 2.36 milliamps. Keep in mind, you would get a number much less than one, nine divided by 38, 20.044. So I turned it into milli, so you can see that. So that was one question. What is the current in the circuit? 2.36 milliamps coming out of the battery, going through this wire, going through the resistive graphite, going through that wire. I think the other question, okay, so check. Okay, what is delta V across each? How do we solve it? Ohm's law, V equal IR. Delta V for the left is going to be the same as delta V for the right because they have the same resistance. It's IR, 2.36 milliamps times 0.022 ohms. All right, and what do we get for that? Um, 5.2 microvolts. I have a mental concern that I messed up these resistances, but even if I did mess up a little bit, the point of the problem is this is very big. The resistance here is very big. The resistance here is very small. If we find a mistake later, the same 
the point still applies that because the copper wires have such a low resistance, you get a very small amount of the nine volts across them, 5.2 microvolts each VL equals VR. So we could say, what is delta V of the graphite rod? Well, then you would say you could apply this law, 2.36 milliamps times 38, 20 ohms, and you're probably going to get something bigger than 9 volts. You're going to panic. The only reason you get something bigger than 9 volts is rounding. You probably round it up somewhere. The point is, this number, if you did everything without any rounding, would come up 10.4 microvolts within 9 volts. It would essentially be 9 volts. Okay. So what the point of this was to calculate, um, use some of these formulas, but also to find that if you have copper or metal wires, that wires are perfect. When we're doing simple circuit diagrams, we don't worry about the voltage drop across the wires because we assume the resistance is zero, so there's no voltage drop. The current does go through the wires, but there's no voltage drop. Okay. Do we assume the battery has no resistance? Uh, for now, you can. We'll get into real battery maybe later if we have time. Um, but there was one more question here. How much power is dissipated? We haven't talked about power yet. Let's look at power real fast. It's a very simple formula. Let me see. We can get it through one page of notes in 17 minutes. At this rate, we shall finish at 12.34. We will finish at 11. Power dissipation. So the idea here is that um, charge carriers lose energy. You may recall that the idea of applying an electric field to a conductor should make the charge carriers accelerate. But our microscopic version of current flow, we said it's at a constant drift velocity. So how can it be at a constant drift velocity? The answer was that it's going through like a, a highly resistive medium. It's essentially at terminal velocity as it falls uh, like, like you would do falling through the air. So a drag force is pulling back on the charge carriers while the electric field pushes it forward. And those balance and you reach a terminal velocity. Um, a drag force is going to lead to energy loss. So that's essentially what happens. The charge carriers lose energy and you calculate it from their delta V. You have a point charge, it goes from high potential to low potential. So it's very straightforward to calculate um, how much energy is lost. So if we want to calculate the power, the dissipation power, we know power is always energy per unit time. So in some time, you lose some amount of energy. How much energy do you lose? It depends on how much charge flows over what delta V in some delta T. So I'm simply saying that in a certain, you know, if the current is the flow of charge per unit time, we say in some time, how much charge flows, right? That's just delta Q. You could say that this is like, I must not say that. This is just how much charge flows past a, a cross section in delta T and how much energy does it lose as it went through the resistor Q times delta V. So all this is really doing is letting you realize that's the current. So the power dissipation in a resistive element is just IV. P equals IV. That's the whole equation. It doesn't get more complicated than that. So you look at that, and now we could calculate how much power is dissipated in these elements. Let's look at the power in the left. It will be the same as the power in the right because they have the same current. And remember, they have the same voltage drop because they have the same resistance. So very small numbers. The current 0.00236 
the voltage drop point oh 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 uh, oh five two volts so you get like something very small 12 nano watts so the perfect wires also don't really lose any energy they don't heat up much but the graphite where most of the drop of the voltage is is the 0. 0.00236 amps or 2.36 milliamps times the full nine volts essentially loses all the volts and you get 21 millivolts So again, the point of this was to practice these calculations, introduce you to these ideas, but also to show you that you don't have to worry about the wires. Not much is happening in the wires. Okay, so that was the introductory problem. Now we are going to talk about how to draw circuit diagrams. Now I'm giving this lecture completely straight, but I do feel like I did hear one bit of health information I need to pass along. I don't know if you've heard, but there's a new sexually transmitted strain of the coronavirus. And they're worried it may become a pandemic. So be careful out there. Okay, now we need to talk about the elements for resistors. What, how we draw it, what it looks like. Okay, in the real world, a resistor that you will use in the lab looks kind of like this. And this is almost exactly what we drew before. You have highly conducting wires. You have this ceramic-y kind of a thing that has a high resistance and highly conducting wires again. That means you only need to worry about the resistance of this part. This color code is how you figure out the resistance. You may wonder why they don't stamp the numbers on there. It's because this is cheaper and easier to do. So in real life, it looks like that. Um, the symbol looks like that. So it's just a zigzaggy line. It represents the current having trouble getting across that path. We label them with Rs. Clearly, it means resistance. And that's really it. So the wires are just going to be little simple lines. But as you know, um, uh, let's see. If the battery doesn't hold charge, then where do the electrons of the battery come from? This might be a very stupid question. This is not a stupid question. Let's look at the battery. So I drew the battery like this uh, with some EMF. All right, and we put a, well, we can hook it up to that. Current flows, where does it come from? So it comes from chemistry. There are electrochemical reactions happening here, which push charge that way and then suck in charge, or uh, well, it's the same, no, whatever, it's just charge. Uh, charge goes around the circuit. So a, a chemical reaction causes that to happen inside the battery. The main insight that you don't really need, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, is uh, that it's not net charge. The battery is not holding an excess charge. The battery is perfectly neutral. Every element here is neutral. You're just pushing charge through the conductors. The symbol for a battery you need to be familiar with. So it looks like this. Okay. That symbol represents the plates, the electrochemical plates inside the battery. You don't need to know that. So the long line is the positive side and the short line is the negative side. So for a while, I will keep drawing the positive and negative for you, but eventually you need to remember that the long line is the positive side. Oh, I see. So we can't say it holds charge because that implies it holds excess charge. Yes. Capacitors hold excess charge on each plate. And that's one difference between a capacitor and a battery. The capacitor even is still net neutral because it has positive charge, excess positive on one plate, excess and negative on the other plate. The whole thing technically is still neutral, but the individual plates do get charged. If you get extremely deep, which we are not doing in this lecture, Batteries and capacitors are actually similar. It's just a question of what's the source of the energy. Okay, so now you know what a battery uh, symbol looks like. So now we can go through an exercise and just look at resistors in series. Now, in the spirit of this lecture, I should just give you the formula and move on. 
but I am actually going to drag you through it a bit. Let's see. So, because we need to practice at least drawing the circuit. What is that? That is a battery. I drew it with six plates. There is no rule about exactly how many plates you should draw. Sometimes they're drawn with two plates. So that goes up like that to a resistor, to a resistor, to a resistor, like that. And we will call them R1, R2, R3, like that. And let me see, what do we want to say about this? Um, oh, there was one more thing I meant to write about a battery. And that is the idea, kind of like we talked about with capacitors, that batteries are not sentient. They don't look at the circuit and decide what to do. They just experience a condition. All a battery knows is, I've got to send out the right amount of current to where my electrodes end up at the EMF. That's really all they do. So they create a voltage different EMF and they send out a current. I'm going to call it high bat for now. Just to remind you, it's what comes out of the battery. It also goes in here, high bat. It's not that it sends out two times I bat, it's just moving the current around in a circle. So one equation you can always write right off the bat. I, I did not mean to make a joke here. One equation you can always write is the equivalent battery equation, I would call it. So equivalent. And what that means is the circuit, you can imagine it as a single resistor. The battery does not know there are three resistors there. So the equivalent here is Ohm's law for the battery. Delta V is the EMF, I is I bat, and the resistance is what we call the equivalent resistance. What do three resistors in series look like to the battery? That's what we're trying to decide. What do resistors in series do? That is the equivalent resistance. Let's see. So what we would do then is kind of like before, we would guess a current, I bat, and we would apply the loop rule. What was the loop rule? Let's go around this loop and realize that the voltage drops have to sum to zero. So if we go from here to here, what is that giving us? That's giving us a plus EMF because we're looping from negative potential to positive potential. Final minus initial, positive EMF. And then we loop. We know the wires are perfect. There's no voltage drop across the wires. And now we're looping with the current across that resistor. Is that a positive or negative delta V? Think about it for a second. Positive or negative delta V? It is a negative delta V. One way you can memorize it is if you loop with the current through a resistor, it's a voltage drop, it's negative. Or you can think to yourself, well, I know that current flows from high potential to low potential. And I know changes are final minus initial. So a smaller number minus bigger number, negative. Either way you want to memorize it. Minus I bat R1, that's the delta V there. And same thing here, and same thing here. Minus I bat R2 minus I bat R3 equals zero. So there is our equation. And now what we can do is rewrite it to look like this equation. What we're going to do is move those to the other side. We're going to pull the I. Right? We're going to get the EMF is this term plus this term plus this term. On the other side, positive, pull I bat out, factor it. And uh, you get R1 plus R2 plus R3. And then you look at this equation, and you look at this equation, and you realize the equivalent resistance is just the sum of the resistances. So REQ, one plus R2 plus R3, and if there were more, it'd be like that. So this is resistors in series. Resistors in series, simply add. So that's fairly straightforward. Somewhat more complicated, 
can you please explain the positive and negative delta V on the resistors again? Yeah, yeah let's just zoom in on a resistor here. Um, the tricky, oh, not tricky, Kirchhoff's loop rule. If we were getting into really complicated circuits with multiple batteries, you would really need to think about this real carefully. The kind of circuits we're going to do are simpler, and you don't really have to be a pro at setting up Kirchhoff's loop rule. You just have to know the nine volts has to dissipate across these. But I do want you to understand it better. So my point, I'm just letting you know if this is a little weird, we're not going to really use it that much. Here's a lowercase current, which doesn't mean anything different. And here's the resistance. Now, what this really is, is a material. And charge carriers are going in the direction of the current. Right, so we know they're drifting that way. Okay, charge carrier drifting that way. What electric field would cause my positive charge carrier to drift that way? Have to point that way. So that's the electric field inside the resistor is along the uh, current. And if that's my field, what are my potentials? Well, if you go against the field, um, that would be high potential. And if you go with the field, that would be low potential. So current in a resistive element always flows from high potential to low potential. So you know this is the high side and this is the low side. Kirchhoff's loop rule requires you to think about the loop direction though. So if we're going to be looping this way, and in everything we do in this class, you will loop with the current. Yes. Um, then it's always going to be delta V. Well, you would just call it the potential final minus the potential initial. And it's at the low minus the high. So that's why it's going to be negative delta V R over the resistance. And we usually just directly go ahead and write IR with ohm. Okay. In more complicated circuits, you might have a case where you're looping against the resistor and have to keep up with that. But we don't do multiple weird battery circuits in this class. Let's see, we now need to look at resistors in parallel. This will get a bit more complicated. Again, I could just give you the formula, which I should probably do, but we do need to introduce another concept that you will need. And that concept I was supposed to do first is the Kirchhoff junction rule. We'll get back to that in a minute. So there are two rules. We did the loop rule, now the junction rule. It's something like this. Um, it's that basically the sum of all the currents, I'm using capital I's, in equals the sum of all the currents out of a junction. Okay, this will make more sense if I draw a junction. Here is a wire and it's carrying five amps. What if the wire splits? Mm. And in this branch, it's carrying four amps. You might just intuitively ask yourself, how much current is it carrying there? Maybe you understand or your intuition tells you it's going to carry one amp there. Now, why did your intuition tell you that? You know, you may have thought about current as water that we have to conserve, or you know that we have to conserve charge, but it's basically Kirchhoff's junction rule is just a formal statement that we have to conserve current, okay? So in this case, for the ends, you look at the junction and you look at the direction of the currents and you say the only one in is five amps. And then you say, what's out? equals four amps out. And in that problem, this might have been the variable. How much current in the bottom plus x amps? And you would solve for it and you would get one amp. That's literally all it is. It's more useful in more complicated circuits, but for now it's just saying that the current in equals the current out because you have to conserve current. One thing is to solve a problem, sometimes it's not clear which way the current's going to flow. 
it'll usually be clear in this class, but what if you guessed wrong? What if you said five amps in, four amps out? What if I thought, okay, this one is going in? What would have happened is we would have said, okay, some of the ends, I in plus five amps equals the only thing out is four amps. If you solve that algebraically, you get minus one amp. So the equation fixes it for you. If you make it go the wrong way and it gives you a negative, that means it goes the other way. So these are friendly equations that help find your mistakes. Yes, so we asked, is it because it's conserved? And yes, that is correct, yes. Oh, there's a longer question. Can you please explain the problem? Oh, no, we did that one. Oh, that. Okay, so that's the junction, the concept of a junction. All we got to do now is apply it to a circuit with junctions. And the only way you can make a circuit with junctions is, um, or well, what is re resistors of parallel requires junctions. So let's draw it. And what gets confusing about this isn't really applying the junction rule, it's finding the junctions. There is a single resistor R1, but now let's add another one, R2. So that is two resistors in series. Let's add another one, R3. Three resistors in series, okay? Now, where are the junctions? Well, clearly, there's a junction here, and there's a junction here, and there's a junction here, and there's a junction here. So that's a lot of junctions. You don't want to set up more junctions than you need. If you use all those junctions, you would say, this is I1, I2, I3, I4, I5, okay? And then goodness, well that would that would still be four. Anyway, I'm saying you don't want to do this. This is creating more junctions and more currents than you need. And the reason is this is actually all one junction. If you have two junctions that are just connected by a wire, you should think of them as a single junction. That. Okay. And the best way to see this is I'm going to redraw this circuit with another geometry that is exactly the same. So part of dealing with parallel resistors in a circuit or, or parallel circuits is understanding that the way it's drawn, the choice of drawing the junctions is irrelevant. All that really matters perhaps is the topology. I don't know the definition of topology, but it might be the topology. Uh, these are in parallel. Yeah, I say the wrong word all the time. It is my calling card. All right, so let me draw this another way. And you tell me, is this the same circuit or a different circuit? Actually, no, we are going to do an exercise. Believe it or not, that is the same circuit. All the currents will come out the same. The current in every branch will come out the same. But I've drawn it in a way that it's a single junction. Current going in, current out, current out, current out. And the bottom, same thing. It looks like two junctions. It's really a single junction. Okay. The one way to think of it is every wire going into a junction should have its own potential. And uh, here, if you set up two junctions, these wires are the same potential. So there's really no need for that to be two junctions. It's one thing to look for. We're not going to do a bunch of weird IQ test circuits trying to trip you up on this. But I just want you to understand that this is how you have to think about it. Let me draw this another way and see if you can get the hang of seeing these as the same circuit. Let's see. That is the same circuit. Okay. Here, this whole part of the circuit is at the high EMF. Basically, the top side of each resistor is at the high EMF. Here, the, this whole wire is at the same EMF. High EMF, high EMF, high EMF. Those are the same circuit. Again, all I've done here is break it into two junctions unnecessarily. And I drew one of them a little high. Doesn't matter. 
Let me draw it yet one more way. That you might see, that you might find strange, is what if we went off the Cartesian grid? You might see that and panic, but you might realize all I'm going to do is bend the wires. And it looks like the second one I drew. Here's a junction, here's a junction. So when you do a few circuits, you'll get used to this, okay? But realize the geometry of the wires doesn't matter. They're perfect wires. Let's see, that is 1020, it is 1021. So I'll see you in five minutes and we'll solve resistors in parallel.
we are now prepared to solve the problem of resistors in parallel. But I realize I need to redraw it my initial way so that the labels work. So this was R1, this was R2, and this was R3. I did not need to draw it that big. Um, there's an EMF like that. So one thing, if you want to try to calculate, you know, what is the current and what is the equivalent resistance, you want to start with your little rule about the battery. The battery just sees an equivalent resistance and it sends out the total current. So the e, uh, EMF, sort of the volts of Ohm's law, would be the I bat, the current coming out of the battery, uh, times the equivalent resistance of the circuit. And since it's resistors in parallel, solving this will tell us how resistors add in parallel. So here we have junctions. So we need to define the current in different regions. Depending on what you're asked, you might need to define it everywhere or you might not. But for here, we're going to define it everywhere. So we know that this is I bat. And we know it's going to separate here and it's separate there and separate there. And we know we don't, we can think of this really as one big junction. We don't care about breaking these two down into some intermediate value. We'll just pretend that's one junction. So we're going to call this I1. I1 goes into that branch. I2 goes into that branch. And I3 goes into that branch. And we're going to guess that the current goes down because from this circuit, once you've done some circuits, you can tell it's going to go down. And then they're going to recombine down at this junction. Okay. So when you're doing this, you don't set up an equation for every junction and every possible loop. There's a little bit of experience in knowing what to set up. Your book, I will find it and recommend it for you, has a guideline of how many junctions and how many loops to do. But there is a little bit of experience in it, unfortunately. It's not quite an algorithm to solve it. So what we want to do is usually you just do one less than the total amount of junctions. <coughs> so here we have two junctions, so we only need to do one. So if this is our junction, let's see if we're going to pull out the law. Sum of the current in is the sum of the current out. So in this junction, I bat is the only current in. And the currents going out are one, two, and three. So I1 plus I2 plus I2. And you can see how sometimes these Kirchhoff laws give us fairly intuitive things. I bet is split into three branches. So we have to conserve current. So there you go. So that is what the junction rule gives you. And maybe now you can see why you don't apply it over and over again. We could apply it to this junction as well, and we're going to get the same equation. We're not going to learn anything new. So now what we want to do, though, is apply the loop rule. And you could say where and how many times. That's where the experience comes in. We have a lot of unknowns here. We uh, don't know I battery. We don't know I1, I2, or I3. We have four unknowns, four currents unknown. Assume you're given the resistances of the EMF. So four currents unknown means we probably need four equations, and we have one. So in this case, we need to do three loops. Now you could do essentially any continuous loop of wire. You could do through the battery and all the way around. You could do through the battery, through R2. You could do just around R1 and R2. You could loop R1 and R3. You could do just around R3, R2. I mean, you can do essentially any loop. It doesn't even have to include the battery. Kirchhoff's law will be true. But you want to think about what algebra are you setting up for yourself? We don't really need to have equations where we have mixtures of R1 and R2 and R3. So for this problem, the loops you would want to do is to go, okay, let's do loop one. Let's go through the EMF and then through R1 and we're done. That equation will only have the EMF and R1. Right, so we're looping, and we get a positive EMF. Right, we went from the 
negative side to the positive side. And then we went with the current, so it's a minus I1 R1. Right. Or if you are down with, or if you are an aficionado of Ohm's law, you would say, oh, I just apply the EMF to R1. E V equals I R. You can think of it that way as well. Or you can just say, these are wires. I know this point is going to be at the high EMF. This point is going to be at zero volts. So V equals I R. Yes, that is all it is. But the formal way you can think about it is the loop rule. So what other loops should we do? Um, probably want the battery in each one of them. And then you like just one current and resistor. So how about this loop? Now, R1 is inside that loop, but it's not part of the path. So that loop is just R2. So that is plus EMF minus I2 R2. All right, we lost I2 R2 here. Those have to be equal to zero. So similar thing. EMF equals I2 R2. And perhaps you can see now what the third loop is going to be. How about we just have the battery in R3 and I3 in one loop? Then we would get EMF equals I3 R3. I didn't write the loop rule for that. So that was use of the loop rule. Technically, you could also just think of it as V equals IR. Right? This EMF, anywhere there's wire, it's still at the high EMF. EMF volts, zero volts. V equals IR. You could also think of it that way. So now we have four equations and four unknowns. And you might worry that that's going to get um, out of hand or something. But then you got to ask yourself, what are we trying to solve here? So, oh, we have, I forgot, we have this equation. <laughs> we have five equations. Uh, so what we want to do is basically replace all the currents. Because what we're really trying to find is a relationship of what is the equivalent resistance for all these other resistors? What do resistors in parallel do? So we're going to just replace all these current terms. Okay, so replace currents. I bat is EMF over R equivalent. That's the total current coming in. I1 is EMF over R1. I2 is the EMF over R2. And I3 is the EMF over R3. And then you start to see the formula, perhaps you have seen before, cancel, 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 cancel. They all have a 1 over them. And you get 1 over R equivalent is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. And if there were more, it would be like so that's how you add resistors in parallel. So resistors in series, you just add the values. Resistors in parallel, you add the inverses, and you don't want to forget to flip it back over and get the value. When you add resistors in series, the resistance gets bigger. When you add resistance in parallel, the resistance gets smaller. And if each one of these was 2 ohms, 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 would be um, 3 over 2. Flip it, oh, I'm sorry, if the, yeah, no, that's right, 3 over 2, flip it back over, and it'd be 2 thirds of an ohm. Each one was 1 ohm, but altogether they would make less than an ohm because resistors in parallel um, uh, make the resistance smaller. If the positive and negative side of the battery were switched, let's see here, if the positive and negative side of the battery were switched, would the loop rule be this, since the top R1 would have negative? So I'm not trying to answer exactly that, but let's say if you switch them, all right, if you switch them and you said, well, I better make the currents the other way, the math would be exactly the same. If you switch them and guess those currents the wrong way, uh, there would be a lot of negative signs flying around. If you solve for these currents, you would get a net something that when you plugged in numbers, you would get a negative value for that current, which would be telling you actually the current's going the other way. If you did a bunch of plugging in and solve for this equation, basically all the terms would be negative and it would cancel and you would get the same answer for the equivalent resistance. So yeah, so flipping these but leaving the currents down is the case of just guessing the currents the wrong way. If you guess, you know, 
opposite directions and all the negative signs would eventually work out. I'm not sure what that would do to this. Let's see. Okay, so that is the two cases of resistors. What we got to do now is use that to solve a complex circuit that has mixtures of series and parallel. Okay, so this board is called a complex circuit. All right, I'm going to draw for you a complex circuit. So it has a battery, 12 volts, 12 volt battery. Comes up here and goes to a one ohm resistor like that, down to another one ohm resistor like that, and then splits over to two one ohm resistors on this side and one one ohm resistor on that side. And that's it. And then it comes back together. So you can think about all the different ways you could have drawn this, different shapes. But essentially, one junction here, one junction here, and this branch is in parallel. Okay, so we're going to ask several questions here. We're going to call this resistor A, we're going to call this resistor B, and um, I'm not sure what we're calling C. I have a C, I think I mean that resistor, yeah. I have a C written next to that resistor. So we could ask many questions. Um, first we would ask, what is the current? How are we going to find the current? Of this big mess. Okay, and by the current we mean the current out of a battery. What is the current I battery? The total current is often what it's called. All right, so the first equation, you know what you can write. You can say for the battery, it puts out an EMF, it sends out I battery because it senses the equivalent resistance of the circuit. So really to find the current, all we got to do Let's calculate the equivalent resistance of the circuit. Okay. But we have this mixture of series and parallel. Okay, so if this, so we're gonna find that, find REQ of mixed uh, series and parallel. So I'm gonna show you how to do that now. So what you can do is apply our rules about how resistors add in like pieces. So what I would say is this, the REQ, the equivalent resistance, equals, so it looks like this, with this in series, with this whole thing in series. So you could say it's RA plus RB plus R, and I'm gonna write branch plus the resistance of whatever that thing's doing, okay? So let's uh, do that. So this is one ohm plus one ohm plus, now what is the resistance of the branch? It's two things in series. So if we wanna get a term here that is like a resistance, we would do it like this. We're gonna add it one over one side plus one over the other side. Remember, that's one over R of the branch, so that's why we're going to flip it back over, okay? So it's these two resistors in series, I'm sorry, these two resistors in parallel. This side is one ohm, this side, oh my god, we have series again, but you can do it real quick, it's two ohms. One plus one is two. So we can say one over one ohm plus one over two ohms. I'll give you some little notes here. This is the left and this is the right. Okay. So then you would say, what is this? This is those two together make two ohms. What is that? One over one plus one over two is two over two plus one over two is three over two. Flip it back over, it's two over three. So it's two thirds of an ohm. Okay. Two ohms plus two thirds of an ohms 
is uh, this is six thirds plus two thirds is eight thirds. So the total equivalent resistance is eight thirds of an ohm. That's all the battery knows is that it's eight thirds of an ohm. How much current does it need to send out? Here we go. The EMF of the battery equals uh, the current of the battery times eight thirds of an ohm. So 12 divided by eight thirds. 12, 24, 36, eight and 36, four and a half amps. My battery is four, four, five, eight. So that's how you handle a complex circuit. You have to do little combinations of series and parallel. Let's remind ourselves that answer and look at more things we can do uh, with this now, now that we know the, the current. And there's more to calculate. Let's just, I've got a few other questions here. So I'm going to erase this. Hopefully you're caught up. Let's see, here I had a few more. Uh, what is delta VB? What is the voltage drop across that resistor? Let's see, well, you may start to think, like, can you run through the parallel? Oh, no, I can't, we've already moved on. But uh, we can do it again someday. And it's in the book. Or you can just accept the rule. <laughs> one over R plus one over. What is delta VB? So you may think, oh my god, I have to do some sort of Kirchhoff loop rule to get a delta V, but you don't. Apply Ohm's law. Remember, you can apply Ohm's law to any element in a circuit, to the whole circuit, to a branch of the circuit. Ohm's law will always apply. Okay, so let's apply Ohm's law. We say, okay, delta V across resistor V is whatever the current going through resistor V is, and we know the whole four and a half amps goes through resistor V. And we know the resistance of resistor V, so it's 4.5 volts. So that one is straightforward because it gets all the current. What is delta VC? Okay, this one is not as straightforward because it doesn't get all of the current, right? It splits here and only gets part of the current. So there's a lot of ways you can go about it. Um, well, let's see. So you want, what, what you could say, what is the voltage across C is the same as the voltage across those two. Right, so delta VC is the potential here, right, minus, or from the potential down here. So this minus this. Um, so rather than worrying about splitting this current, you could say, it's the same as delta V branch, okay? Because for this circuit, delta V over this resistor equals delta V over these two resistors. I say, how can that be? This one's one ohm, this is two ohms. They have different amounts of, different amounts of current, but we're gonna get away with not calculating that current. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say uh, ohms law, of a branch, the whole thing, then that delta V branch, which is the same as delta VC, equals the current through the branch, which is four and a half volts or amps, right? That four and a half amps goes through the whole thing as though it's a single resistor, times what is the equivalent resistance of the branch? It was two thirds of an ohm. Remember, it was 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 is 3 over 2, flip it back over. So I just say it's 2 thirds of an ohm. R branch. Okay, so there we find that it's 3 volts. Now, we didn't figure out the current in C, did we? We just said it's 3 volts from here to here, therefore it's 3 across that and 3 across that. Now we can figure out the current in each one. How much current is here? Three amps. Right. V equals IR. Three volts, one ohm, three amps. How much is here? 
one and a half amps. Three volts, two ohms, one and a half. What's one and a half plus three? Four and a half amps. And once you keep breaking it down, eventually you can get every number. It's not like you're limited to only calculating certain things. Okay, so that's the idea of breaking a circuit down into smaller parts. Okay. Can you ask that? Wow, the lectures go much quicker when I don't waste so much time. Let's see. Here's another thing we like to do in these classes is make you do light bulb problems. That's literally what my notes say. Light bulb problems. Um, so let me just draw it first and then we'll, we'll ask the question and we'll talk about how light bulbs work. Battery. Going to a thing that we draw like this. We draw a circle, and we draw a little curly Q that is the filament of the light bulb. And you may worry that they aren't connected. That's just how we draw it. So there's two light bulbs. And now we're going to go down and we're going to connect to a light bulb like that. We're going to connect to two light bulbs like that. And over here, we're going to put something called a switch. All right, and the switch can open and close. We'll tell you about switches here in a minute. Um, so in this problem, we have identical bulbs. And what that means is they all have some resistance R. So we could put R's on all of them. They all have the same R. Um, identical bulbs and, uh, and an open or closed switch. Right. So that could be open or it can be closed. Um, and the question we're trying to answer is what happens to bulb A? No, I didn't label it. Bulb A. Oh, there was a bulb down here. Bulb B is down here. What happens to bulb A? When we close the switch, does it get brighter? Does it get darker? Does it turn on? Does it turn off? Does it explode? Etc. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's see. Uh, okay, so we need to talk a little bit about a resistor or uh, the switch. So here's what I need to know: open. Switch like it's drawn there. Think about what you think the resistance of that switch is. Is infinity. And a closed switch is zero. It's just a wire. Okay. So a switch is just a little device we use to change a circuit and make you think about it before and after. It is also used in the real world. It's not just a made up teaching object. Okay. So another thing you need to know is that a bulb's brightness, when you're asked these problems, you're often asked, does a, does a bulb get brighter or dimmer? You're just calculating P, the power dissipated. It's dissipated as heat and light. And you had to think, what was P? P was IV. But I is current, V is voltage, that's two properties um, of the circuit, which is like more to calculate. So you'd rather usually in most problems is just go with the I squared R. And then you know that the more current a bulb has, the brighter it is. And if all these bulbs have the same R, then yeah, whoever has the most current is brightest, whoever has the least current is dimmest. Zero current means off. Okay. So these are kind of just light bulb question things to know how to do it. Okay, so what happens to A when we close the switch? Hmm. So let's think initial case. 
open switch. All right. Are we going to get any light in that situation uh, right there? Well, we know we're going to get some current. I bat say that I bat is going to flow through this bulb. It's going to flow through this bulb. And at this point, what are we going to get? Well, it's going to split. And some current will go here, some current will go here, and some current, I guess, could go there. Uh, how much is going to go? Well, what we could do is get our branch. Right? Our branch. Because you might worry that thing being open might mean an infinite resistance. And if we have infinite resistance, how can any current flow? And you get V equals IR by a finite V. Uh, R is uh, infinity, then I is zero. So let's do the branch real quick. We'll say R the branch is 1 over R there, 1 over 2R, where R is the resistance of the bulb there. And what is this? This is open infinity plus 1 over infinity to the minus 1. Right? So what is 1 over infinity? 0. Right? So this is 0. So what you get, oh god, I guess we have to solve it out. <coughs> Um, 2 over 2R is the same problem we keep doing. 2 over 2R, 3 over 2R, 2 thirds R. R branch is 2 thirds R. Eventually you'll practice these and be able to do it like that. So the point is, we're not actually doing a number right now. We're just saying, is there any current? And what we can see is there, our, our branch is a finite value, so we know we would have some delta V some voltage drop, which is going to be a finite value, right? You have your EMF, drop, 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 drop. So you have some number equals the current in the branch times two-thirds R. If this had come out to infinity, then, well, you'd say, well, no current can flow. But there is some current flowing. Okay. So initial, open switch, and you have some current. We don't need to calculate for this question. Open switch current, and therefore we have light in A. And now, final, close the switch. Okay. If we close the switch, you might say, okay, current could flow there now. But will current still flow here? Like, where, where will the current flow? How much will go in each branch? And then we'd have to figure out is the brand, amount of this branch going to go up or down? So you might look at it and say, well, I know that before all the current was flowing through these two branches. If some flows here, you're going to have to get less here. Unless in some weird situation, you got more here, it made up for the less there, but that doesn't make sense. You would think that it's going to go down. It's going to get dimmer. But, um, but what if your multiple choice said dimmer, a lot dimmer, or dark? You'd have to figure out which one it is. So let's go ahead and think about our branch again in the case where it's closed. Right. What if that's just a wire? Uh, R, here we go again, equals 1 over R for bulb A plus 1 over 2R for bulb B. And what is the resistance of a closed switch? Plus 1 over 0 to the minus 1. What is 1 over 0 infinity? Now, you don't often write equations with infinity in them and get anywhere, but here we can. Infinity plus a couple of numbers is still infinity. And what's 1 over infinity? 0. So what we find is when we close the switch, the whole branch has a resistance of 0. I mean, this part is 0. And basically, the point is, this is what we call in electronics a short. These two bulbs do nothing because we have shorted them. Short just means a wire goes around them. And you can see what that wire does. It makes the resistance of the whole branch uh, zero. So you could say, OK, what's the voltage drop across the branch? All right. Delta V branch is IR. We know I. It's some big number. Maybe, uh, but what is R times uh, 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 zero? 
So that tells you that you're not getting any voltage drop across the branch, okay? even if you have some current flow. So what's going to happen is the current, the I bad, is just going to flow like that. This is just mathematically trying to tell you that, that the voltage drop across that branch is zero because you have shorted it. You have taken the branch and taken it to zero um, uh, voltage drop. And if the voltage drop across this branch, this part of the branch is zero, what's the voltage drop here? Zero. What's the voltage drop here? Zero. So no current is going to flow through these two resistors if the voltage drop is zero. The only place the current can flow when the voltage drop is zero is where the resistance is zero. So the correct answer isn't just that A gets dimmer, it's that it goes dark completely out. Because all we did is we shorted it. So let's look at another question that isn't quite so straightforward about bulb B. So bulb A, we just took out of the equation, essentially. But what about bulb B? What happens to bulb B? Mm, let's see. What happens to bulb B? <coughs> well, if you're going to think, let's see, we know that the power equals I squared R of the bulb, they're all the same. We really just need to know what happens to the current. And we don't really have to think about branches because B gets the entire current. B equals I squared R of bulb B gets entire current. Right. So you'd ask yourself, how are you going to figure out the entire current, I bet? Entire current I bat. Well, oh, that's not a slot. Uh, yeah, so how do you get the entire current? Oh, uh, you go back to that main first equation. The EMF of the battery is I bat R equivalent. Okay, so it's really a question of what happens to R equivalent when you have it open and closed. Open was the initial, closed was the final. No problem. Let's see. When it's open, <coughs> it's R plus R plus R. Uh, R equivalent is 3R, 1, 2, 3, plus that we've done like five times, it's uh, 2 thirds R. Uh, and when it's closed, as we argued before, this branch is gone in terms of resistance, so it's just 3R. <coughs> what does that mean in terms of the battery current. When you close it, the resistance goes down, battery current goes up. Resistance goes down, battery current goes up, current bulb beam goes up, and it gets brighter. Okay, so bulb questions, sometimes they're quantitative. You know, if we give you a number for the EMF and a value of all the resistances, you can get all the currents and voltages and powers and how much heat is being dissipated. You can answer that. But sometimes they're just qualitative like this. Does the current go up or down? You don't need to know how much, just does it go up or down? All right. This lecture will end in 12 seconds, and I will see you on Thursday. So if you want to know what happens to all the bulbs, you can work it out. But yeah, bulb B got brighter.